Welcome! In this series of videos, we will look at the design of systems using the PowerBasic Windows and Console compilers. Today we will look at finishing the gathering of the information on the computers in the cluster, and then storing it in the SQL Server database. Over on my hardware YouTube channel, I've been detailing the work done to create the computers that will be used in this cluster. Today we are going to continue developing the software for this system. On each of the worker computers there are going to be two software processes, the task service and the task process. What we are looking at today is the task service and storing information in the SQL Server database. This will be the area of the database we are interested in today, the warp core table. This is where we left the code at the end of our last video. Now we're going to add a new library today, which is our drive info library, which is going to pull back information on the disk space and disk capacity of our machine. So this new library is an addition to the existing date functions, PC info and file handling routines libraries. We still have the SQL tool libraries included here, now these are purchase libraries, which I won't be including in the download from the GSF software website. I will leave a link in the description below where you can contact Perfect Sync, from whom you can actually obtain these libraries. I can thoroughly recommend SQL Tools as a series of SQL libraries for connecting to SQL Server or for that matter any other SQL database you wish. So I've created two additional global variables called Disk Server and Drive Letter. Now these are to specify which machine the archive is actually going to be held for this process. Now for the moment I'm hard coding these inside our PB main function to be octal2, which is this computer, and the D drive of that computer. What we're going to do in a future video is we're going to remove this information from the code. We're going to put it into a configuration XML file and the program will always read it from there. The advantage in having an information in an XML file external to your application is that should the information ever need to change, you merely have to update the XML file and the application will not have to be recoded and recompiled. The process as it stands will run the process count function right at the beginning. And if the process is already running, it will terminate. There should only be one version of this process running on each computer at any point in time. After that we prepare the log, we kill off any instance of that log already existing so that we have a fresh log for each run of this application. We're then pulling back the total number of processes on this computer and then we initialize our SQL Server libraries. The next stage was to connect to the database. We're using a SQL Server username and password for the connection and we're defining our database in here. The database itself is a SQL Server Express database held on the Quad001 computer and the instance name is SQL Express. Having connected to the database using our user OpenDB function with our connection string, we can then call the process function and this is the one we're going to concentrate on today. At the moment the process function does almost nothing. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up some variables. We're going to set up a computer name variable, a variable for the drive size, which is the volume capacity of our C drive, a variable to contain the amount of free space we have on that C drive. If this is the computer which is going to hold the archive, we will pull back the same information from its drive volume. So in order to do that, we're going to create a separate little function whose job it is to gather that information. And we're going to pass these variables into it, the computer name, the drive size, the drive space, and the data machine's drive size and drive space. And then if we do get back a true from that, we'll know that the information is there. And then just to see the information as it comes out, we'll throw that out to the log just for debug purposes. 
So let's go and get that machine information. So first thing to do is to create the new function. And we're passing our five parameters. Computer name, drive size, drive space, and the DM's drive size, and drive space as well. All of these being strings. First thing we want to do is to determine the computer name. Now this is using a pre-built function, PB computer name, which is coming from the PC info. And it's using the environment dollar string for computer name to pull back the name of the computer. A very easy function to do. So once we've got the actual computer name, that's the first of our variables populated. The next thing to do is to delve into the functions in our new library. So we're going to populate the drive size from the get drive size function. And we're going to store that value inside here. So both of these variables will have the same information. Let's just assume it's going to return true. And if we try running it now, we'll see that it's pulling back each volume on this machine and how much volume space each of these drives can actually hold, which is perfect. We just have to pick the volume that we're interested in. So we're going to use the parse command for that. And we're going to slice up that string to give us the information we're actually after. The parse command is very useful. We're using the parse command with the semicolon as a delimiter. And then we're parsing the information we have parsed using a colon, a slash, and a space. So if we run this now, we'll see that drive is pulling back 118, and that's gigabytes. So the C drive has 118 gigabytes in total that it actually has on it. The next thing to do is to pull back the amount of free disk space is actually on those drives. And we use a second function in our drive info library called get drive space. If we run this one now, we will see what it's pulling back is the free disk space on each of the volumes. All we have to do is the same thing we did as before and just use the parse command. Now I'll do this on one line and we'll pull back all the information we want to get it back in the gigabytes. So it's taking dry space, parsing it first of all using the semicolon, and then parsing it again with spaces. So if we run that now, we'll see 118 gigs in total, and it has 38 gigs free on the C drive, which is perfect. Now each machine this process actually runs on will be a processing machine, part of the cluster. One of the machines the process will be running on will actually be the disk server, the one that holds the main archive. Now since we've populated the name of that machine in the global variable, all we have to do is to test the computer name we're running on to see if it's exactly the same as the disk server name itself. We're using the UK's dollar command to make sure that the comparison is case independent. And if it's not that machine, then we will make both of these variables effectively zero. So only the disk server machine, the one holding the archive, will have this information populated. And just as we did before, we're going to use the parse command to do exactly the same thing to pull back the DM drive size and drive space. So if we run this now, we'll see we're getting the information back for the drive size total and the amount of free disk space. So in both of those volumes, we have plenty of free space. Now that completes the gathering of information. Now that we've got the information itself, we need to insert it into SQL Server. And this is what we're going to use these two variables for, SQL and Error. We have two options here. We can either write the SQL code directly inside the application, for example an insert statement, or we can call a store procedure within the database. We're going to use a store procedure within the database itself. The advantage on that is, should the store procedure ever have to change what it does, then I don't have to change any of the executables. 
and merely have to change the store procedure within the database itself. That gives you a lot more flexibility. So we're going to use a store procedure we're going to create called update heartbeat. This is going to have a number of parameters, which is the data we have just gathered. Now for SQL Server, since the computer name is actually a string, we have to delimit it with single quotes, and then a comma for the next variable. And as this is going to be treated as a number in SQL Server, then we don't need any quotes for that, just a comma between each of the other parameters. Now in order to get this into the database, we're going to use a new function in our generic SQL library. And this function is called run SQL. It only takes three parameters. The SQL string we've just set up. It will pass back any information in the error variable and the handle of the database, which we set up as a constant. And if it returns true, then we know that the heartbeat has been updated. If it returns false, then we'll know that something has gone wrong and we can actually publish the error message. So if we have a look in the generic SQL functions, we'll see that the run SQL one in here, again, as I said, takes three parameters. Now it's calling functions within the SQL tools library. The first of all is the SQL statement function. Now with this particular function, I'm taking the approach at I'm hard coding the statement number. Now in SQL tools, you can have several statements running at the same time. For example, you can run statement one, and while statement one is still open, you can run statement two, and it handles them quite independently. I'm taking a simplistic approach in that I'm only running one query at a time. The following query will only be run when the first query is actually closed off. SQL tools will support multiple queries running, but for simplicity, I'm just doing one at a time. So what we're doing here is we're checking that we can actually run the SQL that we've been given against the database. The result we get back is either going to be a success or a success with info if the statement has been executed correctly. And we'll return a function equal true. One option is it might return no data as a no data has been updated, in which case that's fine. We're still taking it as a true, and only if it returns something other than that will we return a false. And then we will pull back from SQL tools a list of all the SQL errors it's reporting, and we'll pass that back to the calling function. And at the very end, we will call the SQL close statement to close off the connection to the database for that statement. So run SQL is a good function to use if you just want to file and forget information to the database and you're not expecting to pull any information back. So having done all this, that's all the coding in our per basic application complete for updating the heartbeat. What we have to look at now is the database itself. So if we remote connect to our database, we will encode one now, and if we run our SQL Server Management Studio, now, when you run SQL Server Management Studio, it does take a moment or two to load because it's quite a big application. And it will ask you which server you want to connect to. Now, you can run SQL Server Management Studio from any computer you have. It doesn't necessarily have to be the machine on which SQL Server is actually running. We're connected in here and we can look at the databases. And we'll see the Kronos database, which is the one we are interested in. We open it up and have a look at the tables. Now, there's nothing apart from system tables in here, and there are no stored procedures. So what our task is, is we need to create a new table. So to create a new table is quite straightforward. You point at tables, you right click, and you click new table. Now this will give you a little wizard to define the column names within the table. It's good practice to have a primary key in all your tables. I'm going to create an identity column. And it's going to be the data type of an integer. Now this is an integer in SQL Server terms, which is not the same as an integer in PowerBasic. It's equivalent to a long. Now down in our properties, one of the things you can do, you can go to identity specification and you can double click on it where the identity is yes. Now it's going to set the identity seed as 1, so the first record going into this table will have a value of 1 in the table. And it will increment by one value for each record you go in. 
this is a very useful automatic way of giving you a unique value for each record in the database. And having set that field up, simple right click and clicking set primary key to make it the primary key on this table. Now we can set up the other fields. Now we know we're passing the name of the computer. So we're going to call it machine name. And I'm working on the assumption that your computer name is not going to be longer than 50 characters. We're going to create a field which is going to be our heartbeat. This will be a date and time. Therefore, anything we put into this table will have a timestamp against it. And we have four more values to put in. Disk space, total disk and the DM disk space. We'll store all these as integers. Now, having defined each of the columns, we then have to save this table. So clicking on the save icon allows us to save and name the table. And that's done. Now, if we right click and hit refresh on our tree, we'll see that the warp core table is now appearing on the list. And it will show us all the columns we've just set up. So we can close that down. So we now have a table. We right click, we can select all the data in the table, which at the moment is absolutely nothing. But it's showing us all the columns we expect. So having created the table, we now have to create a stored procedure that we're going to call, which is going to put data into that table. Now the name we decided to give the stored procedure was update heartbeat. So we'll just copy that. And we will go into our stored procedures. So we click on Store Procedures, right click and Store Procedure. This will create a template for you. And what we're going to do is in here for the name of the Store Procedure, we're going to put it in there. Now it comes in two parts, basically the owner of the object and the name of the object. DBO is database owner, I usually do that. So we now have to decide on our parameters. We know we're going to have a total of five parameters. Now each parameter is preceded with the at sign and the name of the parameter. And then the type of the column. Now I'm creating all these as varchars with a length of 50 characters to match what we had in our table then our total disk and our final parameter all of these being integers now down at the bottom here where we need to put our insert statement now the idea behind this table is it will contain the current value of the heartbeat for this particular computer so the very first time we run it, there'll be no data in the table for this computer. But any subsequent run will mean that there's already an event in the table. So what we have to do first of all is determine if there's any information in the table already. So we know whether we can update or insert. So we need an if command. This is actually counting the number of records in the warp core table where the machine name equals the computer we passed on the parameters list. Now if that's greater than zero, then it means there's already uh, an entry in there and we need to do an update. So we start a begin statement and then we put an update command in. Now what the update command is doing here is you're telling it the table we're updating and we're setting the heartbeat column to be equal to this inbuilt function which returns a date time which will effectively be the date time of our heartbeat. And then each of the fields are actually going to be populated with what we passed in on the command line. And where the machine name equals computer, because we know there's already one record in the table. And at the end of that, you can then end your block. And then we can put an else in. Now the else will be triggered if 
the value returned by this if statement is 0. And inside this block, we want an insert statement. An insert statement will insert a brand new record into the table. This will run for the very first time this particular machine has actually been in the system. We're inserting into the warp core table, and these are the fields we're going to be updating, and these are the values we're going to be putting in. Again, all but one of the values are coming from the parameters passed in to the store procedure, with the sole exception of the inbuilt get date function, which is going to timestamp the date and time that's running on the quad one machine into that field. So if we hit execute on that, the command's completed successfully. If we right click on the store procedures and hit refresh and then open them up, we will see our update heartbeat is currently there. Now that we've set up the store procedure, uh, it's worth having a mention about security and permissions. Now if we have a look at the database owner user and hit properties, we'll see that the login name that we're going into is Kronos and the membership of that is DB owner, which means that this particular database owner can do anything in the database. If you want a more secure SQL Server system, you'll have to start to get into the habit of setting up permissions individually for store procedures. However, that's a subject for another video. We'll cover that in later videos. So for the moment, we have no issues with running permissions. So if we go back to our code and actually run the program now, we'll see it's giving us the heartbeat updated. So what it's telling us is that it has actually inserted the data into the database. So if we have a look back at SQL Server just to confirm that, if we look at our table again, and if you click on the table then right click and then select the top 1000 rows, you'll see that we do indeed have an entry in the table for this machine. We have a heartbeat with today's date on it at 1419. And it's giving us the information for 38 gigabytes free, a total volume size of 118 gigabytes, and the disk space free on the volume that's to hold the archive. So as we add computers to the cluster and actually install this software on each computer, we would have one line of data in this table for each computer. And this is the information that our monitoring application will actually query to see which computers are actually active and when they last had a heartbeat. Well, that will be for the next video. That's it for today. Thank you for watching.